Well, my name is Bob. <laughs> so, the first part of 12 steps is... <laughs> We're delighted that you're here with us. This is our fourth season of the Studio 620 W MNF Radio Theater Project. Yes. Yes. So they're they're not here this weekend, and our great partner W and and this program has grown, and so we are delighted that you're all here. We got a grant uh, last year from the Florida Management Council. So it was last season and this season, we focused on Florida writers, our stories about Florida, and so um, we have a delicious menu for you today. Uh, Mark has asked me to ask you to turn up on cell phones or anything like that. And that uh, there will be one play, no Berlin, and then an intermission? No. no one play, then intermission, then no Berlin. Okay. <laughs> Began in 1812 on an auction block 
somewhere in Quitman, Georgia. No, it didn't start when Eve force-fed Adam some fruit, nor did it begin when some turtle god dug up earth from dirt at the bottom of the sea. For the black Seminole, creation began when a slave woman named Heaven was bought by a Seminole medicine man named Yellow Horse and taken to Florida's big cypress swamp to live for love. <coughs> yeah. What can I give you for my freedom, sir? Not a thing. Freedom, freedom. Yeah. Can't be. Everything in the world costs. I want to pay you. Let me work your land, sir. Can't. I ain't got no land left to work. Sold it all to buy your freedom. But why? I'm just a woman, sir. Woman, you was heavy. You would men live and die for. Well, that's true. And can I at least tend your house then? No. Ain't got no house neither. I sold that too. For you. Where we live? Far away from slavery. Oh, it's a dream. Just wish I could give you something for waking me to it. They love me. Love you? Is that all? Ain't it enough? Don't know. Didn't let myself love nothing because I was a slave and knew if I gave my heart to someone, someday they'd be taken from me. And I risked losing that someone in my heart. So I never used it for more than the beats. But I'll try to make room inside it for you, sir, since you spent all you had to buy my freedom and since you're sweet enough to put on a plate. I'll try to love you best I can. It'd be the least I can do. For years. Heaven stayed inside Yellow Horse's heart, but for some odd reason could not open hers. <sighs> Heaven tried <sighs> the best she could, but her heart was too old to grow <sighs> or make room. But the medicine man was stubborn. He had magical healing hands. He wetted her with kisses, and poured on her some lip whispers of Love you. Love you, baby. But still, it wasn't enough. Her heart simply would not fill. So I filled my womb instead. I bought the medicine man twin girls. The oldest was black, beautiful as a night with no moon, and blessed with the gift of bend and wind. We named her Cherish Snow. The other daughter was pale, pretty as Sunday morning, could calm and stare the seas with her bare hands. We named, named her Ruby Moon. The birth was hard on Heaven's body, and she died. Went home to glory the next day. The medicine man was grieved. He vowed to give the rest of his life to helping free men from slavery and teaching them how to love each other. He brought scores of Negroes to the swamp lands of the Everglades where they lived free and loved whole. His daughters, on the other hand, grew to despise each other. For it was their nature to be at odds. When they were dark and light, the dry season and the season of rain. But this hate was never, for it kept the balance of nature. And as long as they fought, the rains came and quenched the earth, followed by wind, which carried seed to wet soil. The Everglades' grass grew high and fed both Negroes and Seminoles in a glorious valley called Devil's Garden. The year is 18.
mind of my business. Why? No reason. Just these swamps is dangerous at night. Pa say the White Father's army ain't but miles off, and they're looking for Negroes or half Negro Indians like us to sail back into slavery. And if they don't get us, the Creek Indians might. But when they snatch you, they tattoo them up on your face, and you bear the shame of it for the rest of your life. See there. What's that on your face? Not a thing. Why? What you see? I see pretty. Since when you been pretty, Cherish? You been a sight that saws my eyes long as I've known you. How'd you get rose to blossom on your cheeks? And is that a crack of smile crawling out your mouth? Something's got an end to you, ain't it, Gabby? Nah, well, I'm just beautiful. I wake up looking this way. But if I had a reason for blushing cheeks or cracking smiles, I sure wouldn't put it in your ear. God knows your mouth travels faster than sticks from stuff's got. And you couldn't keep a secret if I shoved it down your throat and hit it in the back of your mind. You better take a good look. I'm a woman. And women don't tell guys why their flesh turns pink. Guys got to discover that why by themselves. Hodge, you're pink not because you're pretty, but because you a pig. I saw you rolling in the mud with that man, Cherish. You forget nothing gets past me except history. What you know, Ruby? This and that. Not enough to write home about, but just enough to tell Pa. I seen you. Laid your back on wet earth like you was trying to look at stars. Only you weren't, because they weren't out. So you look into the eyes of that white soldier. Like you said, you a woman, though. Bite your tongue. You first. You the loud one. I heard you calling out half of heaven. Oh, breath maker and great grandmother moon and sweet sister sky. <laughs> I didn't know land with me required that much calling on the ancestors. <laughs> I've been seeing him secretly since the army set camp beyond the swamps. And he's a good man. And I'm in love with him. Well, ain't that the saddest song ever sung? You know how Pop feels about the white man. And you know what pain our mother endured as the white man's slave. This is not going to sit well with him, and he's not going to stand for this. He won't have to, because no one will tell him. Right, Rube? Ooh, I don't know. Uh -huh. You the one said I couldn't keep a secret. You can't for this. If you have loved me as your big sis, you find somewhere to hide this secret. You put it somewhere so you forget it. Please, Ruby. Mm. No. I can't lie to my pa. It just ain't in me. It's probably why I'm his favorite. Because I'm the good one. I've got to show him your true color, Cherish. And, well, truth be told, I'm kind of tickled pink about it. <laughs> Folks say any time by the storm bruise, it caused the sisters of wind and rain be in battle, and each is trying to squeeze the breath out of the other, though both are weeping tears of torrential rain. Summoning their love runs deep as their hate, though hate be easier for them to clench, cause they have their mother's clothes off. Oh, cherry snow and ruby moon for all night before the younger sister got the upper hand and eased her arms around the older sister's neck. Wanna! Don't fight me, big sister, or I'll drown you in my tears. Give it to my rock and roll into dream. Rock, big sister, I'm not gonna kill you, but you got to rest. You gotta forget this night. Don't. Must fight this. Take this from us. And put our hate to bed. No. Breath. Air. Must drag you deep into the woods, beyond the trees. You must forget this night. Cherish leaves Ruby Moon by a tree and whistles. She runs off. Two Creek Indians see Ruby. They mark her face and carry her away. <laughs> Where's your 
sister? Where's my red ruby? Don't know. Am I my sister's keeper? Of course. She's your blood. Everybody keeps their blood. What's gotten into you, Cherish? Nobody. I mean, nothing, Paul, nothing. <laughs> I saw them storm clouds above. Y'all been fighting again, ain't you? Ruby got mad and run off. I try to chase her, but you know how quick she is. I feel the white soldiers of the creeks done got her, because I can't find her nowhere, Pop. Oh, my God. Not my baby. Oh, Lord, not my one. I got to find her. <coughs> Cherished thought that she finally has her father to herself. After months of searching for his ruby, Yellow Horse finally returned home to find his other daughter sitting there where he left her, but plump as a peach. Cherish the nine months right. If you be my wind, I'll rock you with the sea. I'll take you to the world's end. Don't ever let go. Night has fallen. Yellow horse comes to cherish. She's with the baby. The time has come, Lord. Give me the baby. Let me have one more day with her, Pa. She was just born this morning. I ain't even named her. She don't need a name. You know that. She won't live long enough to hear it call. That gal got a Negro. Sitting on a white man blood in her. And them rivers ain't never mixed into one another with great blood. She's a hollywood. Curse. If I let her live, she'll bring a spell to our village. Come on now. Let me put her to sleep. But she's not cursed. This girl's good as morning. She didn't even crawl when she came out of me. After the midwife smacked her, she tucked her till her eyes watered. And I swear, she's sweeter than milk, with tongue and no teeth. Sure, she come into this world bad, but she gonna do much good. Folks gonna tell tales about this one. Don't make this longer than it has to be. Her life is meant to be short. You made it so when you laid up with the white soldier. But he was a good man, Paul, and loved me past my skin, through blood and into my bone. Then where is it? If your white man is good, now would it be a good time for him to show up his face? He had to leave when his army lost the war. You know that, Pop. Besides, how can he live in this swamp, in this Indian Negro world? Our love could never be but this babe. She can heal all of us. See? These rolls on her palms run deep enough to hold water like yours. That means she has hands made to hold magic. Help me spare her, Pop. How can she go away to a neighboring village tonight, find her mother? No one would ever know. Shh. There is a stir and noise. Can you hear it? But they would be, Cherish. I didn't come alone. Chief John Bird and the others are here. Boss, it's getting late. We're tired of waiting. They come to make sure I did what was best for the village. Give me the baby now, Cherish. But I ain't ready yet. I ain't even got to talk to her good. You know what don't matter. Horse, you and your gal is trying our patience. We've got warm supper waiting. It's time to put that babe to rest. Give her here soon. You be 
good if you beat God. Get a horse. He takes the babe to the river. He takes a snake tooth across the swamp. Ruby moon lurks in the darkness. Yellow horse lifts the snake tooth over the child and begins to pray. What's taking you so long, yellow horse? Stuff mud in its mouth and drown the child so we can go home. Hold your breath, Chief John. Every living thing deserves a good death. Shh. You hear the swamp. See the ruby moon on the other side. Suddenly, the head of an alligator rises from the river swamp. It bites yellow horse, snatches the baby, and sails <laughs> off. You keep that baby's head underwater long enough, horse? Yeah, all is well enough, Chief John Brown. You are a man of your word. Then, yellow horse, no one will ever doubt your loyalty to your village or your place as a medicine man and healer. I say, Yola, the breath maker is with you. She'll come back, Pa. A ghost in the night, she'll come back with the sun in her eyes. And what did I say then? How will I bear it? Your love is the only song that can heal you now, baby. Sometimes, when time can't heal no wounds, new love, like new skin, lies over an open sore, shuts it closed. Sing a song of love, and a new man will enter your heart and fill your room again. You will forget this night. You will heal. I will swallow the wind since they took hell from me. I'll cry until the springs end and weave my own turbulency. For 16 years, oldest sister climbs the hill and cries out from the rocks, mourning for her child. She weeps 100 days, which causes the rainy season in Devil's Garden. Then, then, then in the summer, when the sun melts, the cold heart, she comes from down the rock and green things grows again, and colorful buds blossom. Sixteen years. Stop. Look back. That swamp gator took its cargo to the shadow that stood on the other side. For sixteen years, that baby was raised. Listen. <coughs> and you shall be called half Georgia. Half, because on one side you are half Negro and half Indian. And Georgia, because the white father of this nation is called George, and you have white blood. In fact, you have all blood, and all blood will make you all powerful. Just like the mark has kept me from my father's arms, your blood has kept you from your mother's milk. They are curses, and therefore so are we. We are curses, because the world needed someone, some two, to bear its hate. But we have carried it long enough. Our backs are sore, so it's time to give back. So we will share the wealth of our curse with those who have cursed us. And we won't feel the slightest scar of guilt if someone is killed in the curse. We are simply plotting out for this prologue and truly cursed of their own plots. And now it's time for us to play. Judge Snow waited for half Georgia to return. Seventeen years she waited. In the meantime, she had another daughter, Emma Jen. Ma! Ma, you here? There's a procession forming outside, Ma. The warriors is gathering. I'll see all of them time the treaty to give up his land so Chief John ain't neither. They're going to war, Ma. They're going to strike all it's a heart. Where we 
might be going to walk. We going to walk, Paul? I got to sharpen my blade and get me a horse. I'm going to war, Joe. You staying here with your mom. Staying here? But, Paul, I'm all man. You saw my horn muscle the other day, and then it took your eye out. Paul, you need me. I'm quick. I'm cold-hearted. I'll cut people. You're too young. You're too young, John Coo. You know the law. No man can be a warrior without going on his vision quest first. Now, I don't want to talk no more about this. But, Ma, tell him. Your horse is going to put me on the quest any day now. Once I finish it, I can join you. I'll bring up three and back. Everybody will say, look at the coon jump. The chief's son bringing up the grip. Can't you see? No. But I can see you going in the house and getting ready for supper. <laughs> it's bad enough you pass your going down. Get in the house so I can fix you a plate. But Ma... That's cause you ain't saying nothing. Get in the house now so I can make your plate. Yes, ma'am. You need to give him something. You need to give him something before you go, John. This gonna be hard on him. You need to show him something that his vision quest can't. We go not to fight, but to defend. We want not to keep our piece of land, but for the sake of peace. We fear not brother death. We know he lurks wherever we live, and we should meet us on the battlefield, then we fight him too. In the distance, the warriors are heard. Chief John Bird leads them. Yeah. And the wind is spinning the crack. 
Pastor. Good. are going to cry out by Marcus Gardley and directed by Fanny Green. With Sean Davis as Yellow Horse and Joe Coon, 
Fanny Green as Creek Witch and Bird Sue, Kaina Hood as Heaven and Cherish Snow, Bob Devin Jones as Chief John Bird, Tiffany Schultz as Ruby Moon, Emma Jin, and Half Georgia. In the studio signing for the hearing impaired, Carol Downing. I'm your announcer, Ron Satloff. The Radio Theater Project is a presentation of the studio at 620 and WMNF. talking to Marcus. Yeah, yeah. And you can yeah. tell him working on it. And I want you to meet a friend of mine, um, Lillian Dunlap.
wanted you guys to just talk with Marcus about what it was like to work on the play. Sean actually got the the least amount of time because we got he got texted. He was uh, emailed the script last night, and he and I didn't get a chance to work on it until I got here today. Yeah. Ben yes. was telling me that this is a three-part, like a three-part series. Right. So how do the, the characters come to your mind when you're writing? When you're writing, there's so many characters, and I, I feel like they all have a significant um, role that they play in your. So how do the characters like come about in your head? Well, all of the characters are actually based on uh, names I found in a, a priest who wrote a diary of, about this period, and he was. Uh, people who have been, have been in this tribe. Okay. So all the names come from actual people, but we don't, all we know is their name and like their age when he's right. writing the diary entry. And then, so this play is part of a trilogy, and so the piece we read is from the first installment in the trilogy. And this story is based entirely and solely on a legend, a legend that is popular in, in, in Sudan. And then the second play is based upon historical documents um, that I discovered about the first all black town in the United States and the world. And then the third part of the trilogy is based on um, actually court accounts from a trial that happened in Oklahoma that concerned black women. So it's, it would go from legend and myth to historical documents to court documents. So research. Research. <laughs> right, research. Absolutely. Yeah, it was really interesting, even just the way that they speak yeah. and everything, trying to get that down. Yeah. Like, yeah, what I wanted to do is because actually, in reality, in this particular tribe, the women speak in their own dialect, and the men speak in their own dialect. And I wanted to merge both African American vernacular with sort of like heightened dialect, a, a take on heightened dialect that the Seminoles would speak. So I had to create my own sort of language. Right? It's sort of like a mashup. Yeah, but it works. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You guys were so good at acting, and it was like, the best I've ever heard of. It was yeah. yeah! I was going through it sitting there. Oh, that was great. Yeah. great. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm so happy that we did it just for you. Yeah, that's the scariest that part. Was, I do it when yeah. the director is here. Right. And that was the time. I'm like, I hope, I, I hope we do what you wanted. Yeah, oh, no, you guys nailed it. What I was telling you was the, the headphones, the cord was stuck under the stand, so I couldn't move.
Louise, hello. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask Marcus, um, I, 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 at the last minute, I asked Marcus if he read the announcer so they get a chance to hear his voice and get a chance to see him. But um, I wanted to ask you, was it all right? But I didn't ask him, I should have asked him first to know what he was going to say. <laughs> I was overwhelmed by the reading. I thought it was so beautiful. It's the best I've ever heard that script read. It was just a gorgeous adaptation. I want to thank Fanny so much for it. It was really, really beautiful. Not only did you understand the rhythm and the run of the play, but the musicality of the play was so real and visceral. And it was actually, once I uh, gave over to it, and I, I didn't want it to stop. So, thank you for that. I could have been the two hours listening to that. Well, see, I wish that, I was afraid that we had gone a little bit over. So, we got to go and let the people go. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, guys. Welcome back to the month that we're in in some of the February month. We started the show with uh, Mr. Fats Waller, Mr. Duke Ellington, two greats from uh, the Harlem Renaissance. This is a little number by a blues singer from the 30s named Lil Green. I learned it from a guy named Bob. In the top, not a stop.
my script. <laughs> Radio Theater Project presents the continuing adventures of Noel Berlin, Cabaret Detective, Episode 4. I was surrounded by softly pleasant lighting and calming smells. All around me, people were being decent and kind to strangers. Guiltless faces smiled warmly and made right-handed compliments. The bar stool I sat on was perfectly crafted, not only to prevent my back from hurting, but also to repair the damage from years of sitting on other, inferior stools. <laughs> <laughs> For once in my life, I was perfectly content and not the least bit cynical. In other words, what the hell? Where am I? I've never imagined a place like this. It looks like the Alibi Club, but so much cleaner and better lit. <laughs> My name is Noel Berlin, and I've been known to play the piano now and again. I think. Joe! Joe, quick! I need a drink! Coming right up, Noel. The usual adjusted beaver. <laughs> two jiggers of fresh mango cider, a twist of cassava, two dollops of passion fruit, one squirt of brill cream, and a splash of soda. Come again? Okay, I'll make it a double. And congratulations on your six month chip. Six month chip? Say what? No. So good to see you. And the piano's all tuned up, and I fixed that roof lick over the stage. Leo? You haven't tuned that piano since you bought the Alibi Club. Let me use your words here. Why am I paying a piano player if you can't play in tune? <laughs> Music is the stuff of dreams. So treat your house band with respect is what I've always said. Oh, and don't forget to stop by the office on your way out to get paid. You don't mind hundreds, do you? Something is not right here. My favorite bartender is serving me alcohol-free drinks and my skin flint boss is paying me in cash. I thought about pinching myself, but I wasn't sure what I wanted that to do. Noel Berlin, I've been looking for you. Mayor Boyster? <laughs> Listen, I wanted to get your opinion. I've done a uh, cost-benefit analysis of the uh, acreage under and around Tropicana Field. <laughs> we can monetize our real estate asset, transform a vast sea of concrete into a state-of-the-art, pedestrian-friendly residential and retail community that rises along our main transportation artery, resulting in immediate financial upside at around $565 million. We plan to divide these dollars among all our arts institutions. That, that sounds great, but what about the rates? Pro sports in St. Pete's? Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Let Tampa pay for all that crap. Where's <laughs> <laughs> St. Petersburg, for heaven's sake? Oh, I've got to talk public transit. Uh, coffee later? Now I know I've lost it. Mayor Boyster is suddenly making sense. <laughs> I needed a drink and fast, and not another postmodern Shirley Temple. I know. At last it was Belle, the better half of my nightclub act. Belle is to women what single malt is to scotch. One taste and you wonder how you live so long without it. It's more expensive generally, but you know. Belle, the whole world's turned upside down. Get me out of here, will you? No, I want you to meet my fiancé. Evan Moncoria. <laughs> We're starting a death metal bossa nova band together called Demon Zombie from Ipaniba. And I die, die and then dance. <laughs> Catch you, isn't it? Belle, Belle, what's happening to me? Belle! Oh, Evan, come on, we gotta go. Wake up, Evan. Belle! Wait, wait, ow, ow! Wake ow, up! No! Are you okay? Ow! Oh, God. Belle? And then I was staring up at her face and opposite land had disappeared. I felt cynical and I needed a drink. All was right with the world again, except that our friend Rose was still dead and so was Larry the Dark Secrets Man. And we still didn't have a line on who was doing the killing. Thank God, we thought you were dead. Again. No, it was worse than death. 
I was sober, and you were flying off with a third baseman. Well, you know what? We don't have time for cheap dream sequences. It is a short leap from those to flashbacks. Now, I remember a time in my childhood when my Aunt Esther said the same thing. Yeah, no, no. Stop out of it. Sorry. Where am I? You're safe. We're with Meredith. This is the e files office in the Saturday Night Market. We found you passed out in Larry's dark secret. Ah. <laughs> Meredith is the St. Pete assistant VA in charge of the e files. That's E for extra weird. <laughs> Sam, I mean, Detective O'Reilly's boys brought you over here. O'Reilly's out searching for Larry now. Good luck. Larry's on the floor dead. He was telling me about someone named Mr. Invisible who's calling the shots around St. Pete when I heard this humming noise, and Larry's head exploded. It was exactly like my mom's crystal face that day when I definitely wasn't at home. <laughs> there wasn't anyone else in the shop when we found you. The place was empty, just you mumbling something about ordering a Justin Bieber. <laughs> What's a Justin Bieber? It's a Shirley Temple for people too young to know who Shirley Temple is. <laughs> 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 Do you think that Miss Shirley is this Mr. Invisible? No, but that would be scary. Oh, right, Shirley Temple. So, did Larry say who Mr. Invisible was? No, but he did say one important thing. You're too worried about the present, Noel. It's a past that always comes back to bite you. <laughs> what did he mean? I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. Not so fast, Buster. You keep disappearing and turning up all this debt. I can't afford to lose you. Oh, you do care, that's sweet. I just can't afford to train a new piano player. <laughs> Obedience school isn't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we gotta go. Larry's last words have given me an idea. I know, dear. That's why I got you an iPhone with GPS tracking so I can find you when you run off. No, no, no. I told you when we met. I was a rotary guy in a digital world. <laughs> but if you insist, all right. I stuffed the hellish device in my pocket. Hmm. And Bell and I took off. We left the underground markets of the Saturday night market. We caught the trolley over to the office of the Tampa Bay Times. <laughs> what are we doing here? It's time to pay a visit to the morgue. <laughs> <laughs> They've got dead people at the time. <laughs> the morgue used to be a trade name for the archive room, but times are tight at the times. So they rented out space to the city for actual corpses. <laughs> they used the money to help fund the art <laughs> We pushed through the revolving doors into a lobby packed with trench coats, notebooks, and spin doctors. We ran smack into Florida's governor, Rich Schnott. <laughs> no, isn't it? When last we met, I was rich, and you were an alcoholic amateur sleuth. How are you now? You won't get away with this. What exactly? Exactly. What did I just read about you? Ignore what you read in the fish wrappers and you'll be a much happier person. I know I am. So I fired all the environmental agents. So what? I needed a new hot tub in my limo. And the budget's gotta balance. This week, the Times is blaming me for pythons in the Everglades, the Catholic sex scandal, and the new Schwarzenegger movie. I told him to stay retired. You can't pin that click on me. I'm off to a charity deduction. Now watch your back, Berlin. I've got a long memory. Yes, yeah, so do the voters. <laughs> ah, here we are, the morgue. Oh, it's a computer lab. Jeez, things have changed since my last visit. No! Johnny! This is Belle, Belle. Johnny here is the god of the morgue. I have a t-shirt that says so. Hi, Johnny. Johnny, where's the microfiche? Over in the back with the Gutenberg machine and the tin cans and string? What are you looking for? 1967. Anything about the year when they built that upside down pyramid of a pier? You know what? They're tearing that down, don't you? Yeah, somebody's not happy about it. That's why we're here. Oh, here you go. I had enough for the other fella. What other fella? Exactly. What's this pitch? 
Fisher, the St. Pete Pier Committee, 1967. Mm -hmm. Hmm, looks like a big civil project. All oh, the movers and shakers. I looked at the photo. There they were in black and white. Bill Harumph, Gelson Pinter, Dick Wynott, Buster <laughs> Dabbers, all the big dogs posing together. And who's that in the back? No, he doesn't look familiar. He was a funny looking guy wearing what looked like a college beanie. I wrote down his name and we went off to talk to Bill Harumph. Well, Mr. Marin, is it? And, and this is Bell, my bodyguard. Well, let me see that photo. I don't see it so well anymore. 1967, huh? Summer of Doves, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Maybe, yeah. I almost went out with a tie that year. Mr. Harumph, what do you remember about this person right here? The Pimpty Kulitosik. What kind of name is that? No vowels. Apparently that's how they spell our names in Albania. <laughs> Did I mention he was from Albania? Or Arkansas? Yeah, we didn't <laughs> No, we didn't think much about it. He loves sorry dreams, that guy. Uh, lived in a military-style compound on Snell Island with a pool named Jesse. <laughs> and he was on the committee for the new pier in 1967? On the committee? He was chairman and personally put up the money for the whole damn thing. So it was his civic duty. Brought drawings with him from Albania, or Arkansas. He said inverted pyramids were a guaranteed tourist draw. Mm. Why is he wearing a beanie? Never without it. Just a glow in the dark. <laughs> Rich folks, huh? And uh, after the pier was built? They just disappeared back to Little Rock. That's in Albania, right? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we never heard from him again. Ah, uh, thanks. We left Bill Harump's beach drive office, pushing through a line of arts administrators, waiting for a handout. <laughs> Outside, I could see the old pier glinting out on the bed. It gave me the oddest sensation. Bell, I don't know how to say this, but the sight of that old pier is, well, it's making my pants buzz. <laughs> That's your iPhone, dude. Uh, I pulled the damn thing out of my pocket. Bell punched something on the side. Letters started scrolling across the screen. Mm. Noel Berlin, leave the pier alone or it's curlers for youth. <laughs> leave the pier alone or it's curlers for youth? What the hell does that mean? Oh, oh, oh here's another message coming. Damn you, autocorrect. <laughs> Noel Berlin, leave the pier alone or it's curtains for you. Well, that's more like it. Where the hell's Joe? Two slow gin fizzes coming right up. Tune in next month for the next episode of the continuing adventures of Noel Berlin Cabaret Detective. Noel Berlin was written by Paul Wilborn and Matt Cowley. Tonight's episode featured the voices of Paul Wilborn, Eugenie Bondurant, Jim Wicker, Bonnie Egan, and Bob Heitman. In studio signing for the hearing impaired, Carol Downer. I'm your announcer, Ron Satloff. The Radio Theater Project is a presentation of Studio 620 and WMNF.
Radio Theater Project presents Francisco Menendez by Bob Devin Jones, directed by Lisa Powers Tracona. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, give us this day our daily bread. Padre nuestro que está en el sol, sanificado sea tu nombre, venga tu nombre. Hágase tu voluntad. Amen. Come. This is the man? Yes, Captain. What is the charge? Insubordination, disobeying direct orders. And? He's poisoning the morale of the crew with his slanderous words, sir. Well, sailor, what say you to these accusations? My dog will speak what I to the captain. Your dog, that is the captain. No, he <laughs> is nothing but a slave. I am a servant of the Spanish Empire. I take no orders from a slave. You see the situation, sir? I do. You know the punishment for insubordination, sir? Three nights in the brig with half rations and twenty lashes. He must be made an example of, Captain, before his poison spreads. I see. Sailor, you find yourself in danger. You realize that? See, si. but you are not a captain. For that, we could kill you. However, I believe the problem is one of comprehension. It's happened many times before. I will address the comprehension by way of a story. And if that fails... I will address it. The, re the reiteration of relevant facts, names, dates, and places will purpose to illustrate and illuminate my particular history and chronicle my capture as a young boy from my native Mandinka in West Africa. I will relate the harrowing battles, the inhospitable climes, and the unrelenting bedlams I have faced. I therefore, Francisco Menendez, humbly and proudly place this modest narrative before your ears that this may lead you to become a loyal and obedient member of my crew. I will keep it. My arrival to British Carolina in the earliest years of the 1700s was preceded by several perilous months at sea. On that ship, I was strapped, cramped into a space the dimensions of which resembled the width of a colonial football suffused with the remnants of festering and smoldering coal. The ship was filled beyond capacity with human trade. The air inside the vessel was <coughs> close and tight as were the timbers of the ship's construction. Only three-fourths of the human cargo aboard that ship lost province of this life and never made it to the British territories. These hapless souls with indifferent burial were discarded thrown away at sea. Now that bit of ship was seaworthy, remarkably so, secure, filled with the cries and the monstrous epic of our displacement. My countrymen, reluctant travelers, all each of us bound and obligated to a journey, a journey certain to become more abhorrent and loathsome with the fading of each new moon. The stench and squalor aboard that ship was unavoidable, as it was almost entirely unbearable. Even at my young age, however untenable the misfortune of this passage, I was determined to bear it. And although I could not entirely comprehend or even understood what that meant, I somehow apprehended the ocular prospect before me. I must survive this journey. And I did. I did perforce survive it. Arriving in the British colonies some two months and several days in front of what I could determine as the eighth year of my birth, 
I was immediately forced to work, work on a variety of labors, indigo, rice, tobacco, cotton, which comprised the main commerce of that English colony. Toil without ceasing, severe punishment without provocation. Gradually, I demonstrated an ability to learn and understand the language of my captors. I was given a variety of further duties on that English plantation, and I excelled in all of them. Now, see, you were just a slave. <laughs> yes. Yes, for nearly 10 years, I labored as a slave in British Carolinas before the division of that territory into North and South. After years of learning and struggle and struggle and learning and learning, the promise of freedom, cried the hard woman, eventually allowed me to organize the fullest capacity of my mind. I escaped from British Carolina into Florida and lived initially amongst the Indian of the region, for whom I was a most apt and voracious people. They taught me how to master British firearms how to move through the forest without sound or footprint, detection or discovery, and most important, most important, how to strategically fight and vanquish the English. I was more than three years in the wilderness, living amongst the other Indian tribes in the region, the Yamasee, the Seminole, and the Swanee, all the while avoiding capture by my British brigade and their rapacious bounty hunters for whom my re-enslavement would be a boon of the highest order, a runaway slave who could not only read, but think. Iago Faru, Iago Faru, in ya in ya tire, in ya in ya tire, Iago Iago, Iago. I tried without sufficient success to keep alive the memory of my country and of my mother and of my father, for whom I imagined it was their belief, their understanding, there was to be no reunion of them ever seeing their son a little boy again. Somehow, his realization hurt as well as healed him. It was during this time I learned of the Cedric. What is uh, a Cedric? The proclamation issued by King Charles II that promised that English slaves, slaves that made their way to Spanish Florida, would be given their liberty, their freedom. Spanish Florida would prove to be my balm and Gilead, an absolute inevitability like raindrops that find their purchase in the soil. I needed to be planted in some, some other place on this new continent, to a land where I would be free, where I would be free in that place, that soil, that dirt by divine providence or some explicit heavenly intercession was for me to be Florida. Yes. Yes, you are correct. I have been a slave more than once. In the early winter of 1724, upon my arrival in St. Augustine and my quest for emancipation, I was sold twice more. Huh? First by the Yamasee Indians to the Spaniards, betrayed for a bottle of rum and a small harvest of coal. Subsequently, Manuel de Montano, governor of Florida, sold me to a wealthy nobleman of the Spanish crown, Don Francisco Menendez Marquez, for whom I have appropriated my patrimony. So, you are a thief as well. <laughs> that means is where he got his name, dog. <clears throat> One more word and you'll be dragged behind the boat. To continue, I was conferred as a captain. I suspect you and granted my freedom. My time in St. Augustine was distinguished by extraordinary opportunity and advancement. Because of our king's generosity and enlightened Spanish rules governing slavery, laws which are inimical to the English, as we could buy or petition for our freedom, own property, testify in proceedings and courts of law, 
and the prohibition of separating families. I have a family as well, a wife and four children. Well, in 1726, I was appointed by Governor de Montano to be the commander of the Freed Militia in St. Augustine, as I was becoming sufficient and fluent in the reading and mastery and speaking of Spanish. I was also becoming <coughs> indispensable to the crowd. In autumn of 1738, the governor determined a fortified settlement was to be established two miles north of St. Augustine, among the salt marshes and along the banks of the Mose Creek. The site was an abandoned Appalachian Indian village. Uh, I did heard you still there. This northernmost Spanish settlement was christened Garcia Real de la Santa Rosa de Mose. Fort Mose was the first settlement to free people in North America. Now the fort consisted of a small moat, a church, Freshwater well, a long fence dissected with some several towers, which included a watchtower and 22 houses, a hundred, a hundred former slaves, people of diverse origins, African, Caribbean, mulattoes, maroons, and Indian peoples inhabited those houses. The residents conducted much of the construction and the building of Fort Mose under my direct supervision. Now the main crop was corn, which was shared to augment the stores in St. Augustine. Now if the stores proved insufficient, government delivered supplies of beef, pork, and rice, and biscuits. Extensive trade, hunting, between your majesties, our majesties, Indians, was a common practice. And we observed mass every day. I am still in possession of a small medallion of St. Christopher, presented to me by the governor more than 20 years ago. My grandfather has the same medallion. Then I am in good company. The militia has been under my near continuous command, and each of us to a man has vowed to be the most cruel enemies of the English. A vow, no doubt, you have made and to spill our last drop of blood in defense of the great crown of Spain and the holy faith. Now in the year of 1740, the British led an attack of the War of Jenkins' Ear. Fort Mose was sacked, but ultimately we fought the British back. The successful recapture and rebuilding of Fort Mose reunited and returned this vital colony to the Spanish crown. In service, to your same Spanish king. I have innumerable times circled my exodus back into the British territories and led successful raids against the English in South Carolina, Georgia, and Louisiana. During my king campaign as a Cossack, a privateer, raiding English merchant ships, huh? to seize supplies for St. Augustine, I was captured by the British and sold into servitude one more time. I was severely tortured and threatened with castration. As I attempted to orate my release and that of my men, my captors became increasingly agitated that I, to their initial understanding, a lowly, subhuman, subhuman African slave who had the temerity and command not only of their English tongue, but Spanish as well. Thus, their agitation grew to anger then to fury, and finally to rage, when my true identity was discovered. I was whipped with a lash twice 100 times. <coughs> the first 100 strokes came in rapid succession, and as my tormentor drew more blood than tears, I was brined, pickled, and whipped 100 lashes more. Remanded in chains to the Bahamas, and then again I prevailed. I escaped, and within several weeks I returned to my most unwavering and constant ally, Florida. I humbly submit my fidelity to His Majesty 
allowed me to outwit, outfox, outfight, and outpersevere my English malefactors. And now, now, regrettably, even now, my family, after all these years, years of memories, memories that I have turned into legend and into lore, now, even now, I must flee my beloved Florida. The very prospect of leaving Florida, forced actually, fills me with a deep, entirely profound and overwhelming sadness, the likes of which I have not felt since I was a child. When first I arrived in this new hemisphere and I tread the waters of the shores, waters that I have navigated, explored, harvested, and defended most of my life. I have done the state some service, and they know it. I have commanded over a dozen Spanish ships. I have boarded and plundered countless English ones. And I have remanded to the Spanish crown treasures, lives, and unrivaled prosperity and dominion in these new lands. Thus, His Majesty the King has given us his backing in establishing a new and lasting colony in Cuba in the honor and the glory and the greatness of the Spanish Empire. So, say, you have listened to my story. Have you anything to say? The Jew show sign of fraying with your permission, I'll see to it. Capture. Very well. Dismiss. Our Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name, the kingdom come. I will be done. Francisco Menendez was written by Bob Devin Jones and directed by Lisa Powers Tacoma, featuring the voices of Bob Devin Jones, Bob Heitman, and Desmond Clark. In studio signing for the hearing impaired, Carol Nunn. Sound effects by Matt Cowley. Reporting mixer, Mark Profetti. House mixer, Blake Westlake. Technical coordinator for the Studio at 620, Josh Brown. I'm your announcer, Ron Satloff. The Radio Theater Project is a presentation of Studio at 620 and WMNF.
like that Jamie was talking about. She had a hip operation. She just had a hip operation. She was a bit wobbly. But, you know, when she gets back together, yeah. some Sunday or something, yeah. Yeah. And have a know, picnic and a good time. Fun. Yeah, it would be. I would love that. Okay, good to see you.